Thank you, Jim. Um, we're located out of uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, downtown we work. I've been in this business uh, since, started in 1989. Uh, and I've, uh, we moved on up and uh, we now run what's called North Star Commodity. We do a brokerage and advisory service and we put out uh, outlooks into the markets. I do interviews, uh, a few here again today after today's report with uh, Bloomberg to Reuters to wherever. So we get quoted quite a bit of what, what, what we see happening with the markets and, uh, and they're always looking for what our price forecast may be in the long term picture. So uh, basically what I'm going to put together here is just a, an outlook on the markets. Jim had asked me to try to tie in a little bit with marketing to try to make some profitability and things like this. And uh, so I'm going to try to twist this just a little bit of what my outlook looks like and then what I would probably be doing or recommending to people as market advisories and things to look at down the road when they start making sales decisions on what should be done. So I'll try to give you some parameters. You do have in front of you that booklet and, uh, and the slides are all on there so you can follow along as we go through because a lot of times I always like to give and tell people jot things down or be important numbers to watch as you move forward. Um, but the first thing I do or a couple of things that I want to touch on first is the uh, global concerns that influence commodity markets and I think right now you have to always look back and see well what do we have here? Well for starters you got a new administration coming on and this administration is going to talk about uh, trade tariffs, uh, renegotiate trade packs uh, in here and that's going to have some impact. Currency markets of course will always make a big move on the markets as well on what's happening there. Weather is always going to be the number one object I, in my view of what's had taking place. And then when you start looking at it and saying, okay, so what's my object? Is, is the market's got chances to go sharply higher or sharply lower? Uh, you, you look back and you look at uh, total grain production in this country, in the world, and then you, you also look at total global consumption and what's happening. And are there trends that are changing that may impact me uh, in the near future? Uh, and obviously I'll touch a little bit with the acreage estimates on the USDA or what, or what we think is at least going to happen. Globally, what do I see developing here? Well, I think with uh, uh, Mr. Trump now as uh, the president, I would say it's not business as usual anymore. <laughs> I think you're going to wake up every day and going, well, what's next? <laughs> what's about to happen? I think you're going to continue to see at least the rhetoric and the possibility of backlash, trade disruptions taking place. I think those are potentially likely to happen that may impact maybe for a short period of time maybe just for something that would happen just to be talked about uh, that may impact it even for a day or two days or may in impact you for a month two months or even six months I think down the road we obviously have our, our major trade uh, uh, countries that we look at Mexico and China are going to be two of the big ones right now and if we get into some type of trade dispute with them I can tell you that the uh, Ag Secretary from Brazil is already meeting with the Mexican President that if there's an issue we'll, be, we'll gladly try to fill any void that you need as far as grains and meats are concerned uh, that the U.S. cannot uh, fulfill it or is uh, currently fulfilling at this time. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot more market volatility take place. I think that's another thing you look, got to look for. And, and also, just keep in mind, uh, your biggest trading partners are China, Japan, Mexico, and Canada. Those are the big ones that we have. And I think the one other thing that at least may be some help for us down the road here too, is that we're going to look at uh, Mr. Trump and today was out uh, making comments that we have infrastructure is in terrible shape. In his view, we're going to emphasize on building that up and also going to look at the possibility of getting the taxes to go down. I think also when you look at things globally, and I think this is something that is eventually starting to happen, and I think not only do I think it is happening, I think it has to happen to be sustainable. This is a picture of people in Beijing this year, mind you, not granted it's not all the time. This is not fog, this is smog uh, that is built in. 
So you just look at this, and this lasted for about five to six days. Uh, and just another one, that is just smog. 32, reported to be 32 cities this year actually had to go in with air pollution above the legal li or the limits that people could survive on. Uh, so you saw a lot of this. They ended up taking half of the automobiles off the roads. They shut down in, uh, I think, I believe in Beijing, over 70 uh, uh, plants, facilities uh, that were burning coal just to try to slow this down. Like again, it just be gets to be situations when the air or winds don't blow enough. This is what eventually happens. In my view, when you look at this, it is an unsustainable economy. It just flat out is. There is no way. They're going to have to make decisions to make and change their impact of what's taking place. And not only do I think that's going to happen, I think you're going to start seeing it maybe in a bigger way. So I'll share a little bit of what I see developing there. First of all, China is going to start doing some things of taking petroleum as far as making plastics. And when you're talking a little over a billion people, it moves things in a big way. They're going to start shifting this over for corn-based plastics instead of petroleum base. They're going to start the construction of ethanol plants uh, is going to get going. They're going to increase corn into feed rations to improve diets in the, uh, for protein needs to get the protein in the animal units and a better food product on the table. Uh, I am also hearing the potential of converting between 8 to 12 million acres over the next three years into a conservation reserve. That would actually be along rivers and uh, creeks and highly erodible ground it's just to take it out of production and try to turn it into more grassland. Uh, I, China has already announced they pledged $360 billion towards renewable fuel to fight air pollution. They're going to shift out of coal manufacturing plants and bore back into natural gas and renewable fuel. So those are things you're looking down the road. And I will just tell you this, I've heard, already heard the comments of China saying, well, we're gonna build about maybe four to five ethanol plants are gonna get going. That is a drop in the bucket if they wanna get serious. And I am not, in the, in the last 15 years, I've not seen where China just does something in a small way. In most cases, when they get going, it is going to be full force and don't underestimate that in three to four years that they can turn this thing around as fast as they have to. And I think they, had, I don't think they even have that much time to do it, quite frankly. I think they're gonna have to speed this process up. So I think it's gonna be very, very aggressive on what's going to take place. So those are some of the big things that I look at of what could possibly be changing and then what would it impact back to me. The other one that I always like to talk about a little bit too is just to see where you are with economies. And then it's the fact of what people have for disposable income to spend and how things are doing. This is just a uh, chart on our U.S. stock market, which was up about another 145 points again today. Me personally, I thought the stock market has been going up significantly since 2008 and that we were due for some type of correction. Well, it, the markets don't always go straight up. They will get rallies up, set back, rallies up and going. But we haven't had a very steep correction now since 2008 and 2009. And we've been on a pretty good go. This past one, yep, we had a pullback and we held very nicely. That's not uh, that much. And now we've started to move back on up and hit all time record highs. It's done better than I expected. I sat in on another meeting with another gentleman uh, from Ameriprise and he was a long-term chartist and he was just forecasting what he was going to have. I t visited with him before he spoke and I said, so what is your, what's your uh, belief? Are, we, are you bullish or bearish? And his comment to me was, if I'm correct and the patterns do what has happened before, we are coming out of 08 and 09 was the end of a 12 year, no money being made in the economies that we're going to go into between 12 to 15 years of incredible growth into the market. And right now, my belief was I've gone, I walked away going, that can't possibly happen. But so far, he'd be right. And a lot of times what I like to look at is I'll have my own fundamental beliefs of what's going to happen. Then you have to look at the charts because the charts is going to be everybody who's bullish and who everybody who's bearish. 
And what's happening on this market is, you can have all the people that want to talk about this market's going down, but which way is it headed? It's going up. And right now on a technical basis to me, it looks like the stock market is headed in my next upside, you're in uncharted territory, I believe it's going to 23,000. That's where I think it's headed. And I will also tell you this, I put this out on a memo to my customers uh, about two weeks ago when it broke out above 20,000. I said it broke out of a sideways range and it looks like it's heading to 23. And I thought, well, this ought to be interesting to see how many people actually read my uh, comments. In less than two minutes after it was sent, I had two phone calls ready of people going, are you kidding me? It's going to 23,000 on the Dow? I took all of my money out of the stock market thinking there's no way it was going, it was headed down. And when do I get back in? Tough decision. Now, if you're getting out once, you gotta be right on that one and then you gotta be right of when to get back in. So it gets a little tougher. Chinese stock market, what do I see happening there? I think it, it looks like it's getting some legs underneath it and it's starting to improve as well. So I, this one looks good. Currency, everybody gets nervous about the currencies and what's going to happen and what's taking place. This is just a chart on the US dollar index and it's been moving up and you can notice that back in 2008, 9, 10 and 12, we sat down here at about 80% of its, of its value. And that was great. We did a lot of export business as it's going along. And now it's moved up and now it's chopped around in a sideways pattern and now it's trying to work itself higher again. It looks to me like it wants to go higher, technically, says it should. Uh, I'm a little bit hesitant. I, I think if it's going to, that's still my belief that it's going to go higher. Uh, but it, there, we're at a little bit of a crossroads here because it didn't exactly, once it got above this level, it didn't exactly take off and start going you know, significantly. It just can't seem to make up its mind. But bottom line is it looks like it wants to go a little bit higher. But my belief is this, as the currency starts to go higher, everybody goes it's bad for commodity or export business and demand. Not necessarily. Because as it goes up, every day you wait and you're from another country to buy U.S. goods, it's going to cost you a little more, isn't it? So bottom line is if they think it's really trending up, my belief is, is that you're going to see people wanting to buy a little bit quicker. So the demand actually is a little bit stronger, not weaker. It's when it gets to a peak and starts to come back down. Every day, every week, and every month they wait, they're likely to get it cheaper. And that's when they'll sit on their hands, more so than when it's going up. The other thing I look at is other currencies elsewhere around the world. The Brazilian real has been going down, down, down. And now it's got back up and it started to move back up. And they just don't go down forever. They'll eventually turn and start going up. But we're getting back up to an interesting level that we haven't been to since 2015. And if we start closing above this level, then I start getting a little bit concerned that maybe the US dollar has stopped going up and maybe start to go down. And this one is starting to go up. But bottom line is if the Brazilian real starts to go higher, the Brazilian farmers are gonna do what? More than likely just sit on their hands and not wanna be aggressive selling their crop at the present time unless prices go up. Therefore, you can always have the market could go up a little bit more for our commodity prices short term just because these guys may sit back on their hands waiting for something to go back down so they can get a little bit more bang for their buck. The Chinese Remy was always pegged to the U.S. dollar and it worked out great for the, for the Chinese when our dollar index was down at about 80, 82 percent and as the dollar started to go on up, the Chinese looked around and going, Hey, this isn't working. Nobody's buying our goods because the currency is pegged to the dollar so we're too high. So they unpegged it, let it float on its own, deep value. So eventually now countries are coming back in because the Chinese products are a little bit more attractive and they're starting to buy. Everybody looks at this and says it's a, it's a bad thing for us. For agriculture, to me, the answer is no it's not. In the bigger scope of things, if it sells more goods and the Chinese economy starts to turn around, what will the Chinese do? Buy more of our product. More of their economy or their people in their economy turn into more uh, middle class and they have more money to spend and then away, away we go. So I view it as being a little bit more positive. In Mexico, 
the Mexican peso has been, and, it, and I always, I just said, it doesn't go down forever. Well, this one is going down forever. My only advice in Mexico, I think if you want to go on vacation, it probably looks like you get the best bang for your dollar right now is into Mexico. Uh, I have done some studies on this, and regardless of the Mexican peso going down, I never saw a correlation that means they don't come back in and buy U.S. goods. They still are buying. So either the trade pack has been so good that it doesn't have much impact on them. So I think it's more of whether we do anything with NAFTA or anything else that would make more of a significant impact. Other things that I think you need to know that I always look at is going, okay, so what else when I want to set price parameters, where do I think prices could possibly go to when I look at long range objectives to sit back and say, I always look back and I say, well, what's the market? The, it typically every year in 27 years I've been doing this, almost every year it gives me an opportunity to make money. It's just a function of when do I think this is enough or when's the high and how do I determine that? And then second, uh, do I pull the trigger? That's the other big part. Know your long range cycles, uh, price cycles, where are we at? Are we in a demand driven market, or weather driven market or both? What's the best months to sell grain? Uh, know what my break even costs and know what any outside market influences that would go. And is there a way that I could use futures or options in which to take and manage some of my risk? So I'll touch with that just a little bit. First of all, if I'm gonna look at my profitability, putting corn in or soybeans, basically in a nutshell, I went back and just put all the, the uh, prices of what we think it costs to put the crop in, put in rent at 260 bucks an acre. If I can get a 200 bushel per acre yield in December corn, which at, uh, two days ago was 389, today it's 394, 396 I believe it is at the close, uh, or sitting in here, I'd make about 25 to maybe 30 bucks an acre. If I can get my 200 bushel per acre average. Uh, so if I can do that, I'm at least back in breaking some even, but 200 bushel, I could go 220, I'd go 180. At 180, I'm losing money. At 220, looks pretty good, make the sale. But there's no way you could stand up here, know that before at this time of the year. So you gotta make going, eh, 20 bucks, I think I'll take my chance and see if I don't get a little bit higher price. In soybeans, what does it look like I can do there if I ran through all the numbers at $260 an acre rent and ran through my costs? At $10.26 and a 40 cent basis, I make about 55 bucks an acre. So it costs me less to put the beans in and it would probably suggest to me right now that beans probably are a little bit better to put into the ground today than it would be to put corn on corn. So everybody's gonna make their decision. But the belief is right now that the odds would favor that we're gonna see bean acreage go up and my guess is somewhere between three to four, maybe five million more acres of beans and I would expect that the corn acreage will likely come down. Not a lot, but somewhere between three and maybe four million acres less corn. If it goes any greater than that, then it's either more bullish corn or more bearish to the beans in the bigger scope. But kind of figure it that way. And the other easier way to determine of going, well, how many people are gonna shift? Just take how many would actually put beans on beans in a rotation? Pretty mm -hmm. limited, right? Would be my thought. Yes, sir. Every year, okay, you'd be one. But I'm gonna, t I'm gonna be willing to bet you that the minority, you would be a, uh, you would be a minority. Most people won't do it in the conventional farming. It just doesn't work that way. If you've got 94 million acres of corn and you planted 84 million acres of beans, then corn on corn is roughly what? 10 million acres, right? In simple math. Your odds of getting all of it, slim and none. Your odds of getting 50% would be quite a stretch. My guess is you're gonna be about 40% would switch back and forth. That's my rule of thumb. So you're gonna talk about three to four million acres. You're gonna get some of it off of wheat and away you're gonna go. Long range cycle patterns. I do a lot of chart work and I've, when I first got into this business, I sat back and I'm going, well, it's just the fundamentals. It's just supply and demand. That's all it is. Well, I learned the hard way that eventually you better start figuring out that how to read a chart, how to look at a chart, and use this as a tool to, to look at it. And, and lo and behold, you will find patterns 
that fall. And there is nothing better in this business when you're on the right pattern, and there's nothing worse when you're on the wrong pattern, okay? So it's, that's the object. So I go back, I look at long range, and corn has a tendency to bottom about every five to six years, major lows and cycles. Soybeans, and I took a big picture, I used to look at every 39 months, and they just kind of jockey around, and they have that. But in the big scope of things, believe it or not, they bottom about every 14 to 15 years. Hogs post the low about every seven years. And cattle put in major lows every 10 years. That's typically what you find. So, if I look at a corn and you wanted to jot this down, you'd start out with a significant low that happened in 1986, 1992, 1998. You would have another one in 2004. You would have another one in 2010. And your last one, believe it or not, it's an outside possibility that 2016 would be it. I thought Quite frankly, it came in a little bit earlier on this one, but 2016 would fall back into the five to six year pattern. I thought we were coming in early at this one, but it dipped back down a little bit more. So I thought this was a little bit interesting that it's, it's got timing for something that would suggest a possible low in the big scope of things. In soybeans, 15 year patterns, they happen in 1971, 1986, 2001, and then again, believe it or not, potentially 16, which I believe ends up being 2015, is likely was a significant major low in the soybean market. Now, when I look at all the fundamentals, what's in front of me today, and all this huge surplus of grain, I'm sitting back here and going, man, if we don't have another crop problem, this is all in jeopardy of going even lower yet. So this is just interesting that it falls into place. Now, 27 years of study, what's the best month to sell corn? They rank in this order, July, June, March, December. Those are your best months of when to pull the trigger on grain. So that's when you gotta be more heads up. In soybeans, in order, July, June, November right off the combine would be number three. I put this note in, in 27 years, 93% of the time, November soybean futures and December corn futures, looking ahead, will trade above their highs posted in the month of January before they expire. December corn, that's high for the month of January, was 396 and three quarters. It took that out today. It traded above it to 398. November beans, I believe the January high is 1032. We have not traded above 1032 since January. The odds favor you will do that before this is the November beans go off the board. So pretty strong odds of that still happening. In other words, in the last 60 days, the farmers, uh, and, and we all get impatient because we want the market to move. It's December, it's January, it's February. I'm about to go to the field and the market hasn't gone up. What am I going to do with all my grain? All that worrying from November, December, and January, 95% of the time, 90% of the time, was all worried about prices and where they're going, a waste of your energy and effort because it's still gonna go higher more than likely before it's all said and done. So don't worry too much about what had happened in that time period. Cycle lows, if you're live, is there livestock guys in here? Cattle, hogs, okay? Hog market, it has a tendency and they, they stick out like a sore thumb. It used to be about every three and a half years, four years. And what I found out was you take every seven years and they're going just like clockwork. 1994, 19, uh, 2002, 2009, and this would have sat right smack dab at 2016 as a significant seven year low in the hogs this past year that you just put in. And you snuck one other one in here, but you can run these if you wanna run the in-betweeners. Yeah, they all fall into place there about every three and a half years apart. They've got other significant lows. 
but it's a good possibility that you just came off a significant low in the hog market as well. And in the cattle, this one I've always touted, it's always been pretty much like clockwork. 1986, 96, 2006, and 2016 was well advertised to be a significant low in the cattle. And it doesn't mean that you're just gonna take off and go straight up. It does not mean that you cannot come back down and check these out once again and, and make things difficult, but the odds would favor that we should be, quite frankly, in almost all the commodities would suggest that we put in the outside possibility of long-term major lows across the board. Best months to sell cattle? You know what? I went back and researched this and I came up with, I don't know. It doesn't have, there isn't really a good correlation. It's just all over the place. But on the hogs, there is a pretty good tendency. It is June through August. And this would also go for your fall months. Your best, I thought this was the biggest shocker, your best month to sell your October and December hogs is the month of August and September. Those are your best months to pull the trigger on your fall hogs. Using options uh, to protect some risks, there's going to be times, and I've got customers that say, I don't want anything to do with options, I like to have futures, I know exactly where I'm at. But I think there are times that these do come into play and they, they can become handy. It's just that you got to know when they're at. Buying call option is always something that gives you the right to assume a long position at a set price and at a set time. You would buy a call if you believe that the market is going to trend higher. Buying a put option gives you the right to sell it, grain or your livestock at a set time and price, and you would buy a put if you believe the market is starting to trend lower. It's nothing more than doing some insurance policies or doing something else of that nature. That's basically all it amounts to, and I'll, I'll touch with this in a little bit more. Le uh, weather, obviously, is gonna be a key. And in all the years I've done this, I don't know that I can really pinpoint anybody in the weather that I would say, man, they, they're good. They will come in from time to time that can catch it and find the weather, but we have uh, a group right now that we get out of uh, Maryland and all I can tell you is is that most of the year he's been pegging that we are going to be colder than normal, colder than normal. We get to December and he had that one right that it was going to be warmer. January is going to be colder than normal and it got cold for a little bit but it warmed back up. But he says, oh that's just a brief thing. February is going to be cold and looking ahead March is going to be cold and April is going to be cold. And then I catch the news and the WCCO this morning goes, based on our for short term forecast in the next 10 days is true at 35 to 45 degrees, we'll be on the 18th consecutive month of above normal temperatures. So it's real, you've got one forecaster telling you it's gonna be cold and the next one, and the fact of the matter is, we've been trading warmer than normal 18 consecutive months in here. Those are the facts that you have going in. Does that mean I'm gonna hurt the crop? No. Crops probably in most cases rely on a couple of things. One, get the crop planted on an early fashion. Two, stay, uh, don't stay, stay away from excessively wet weather. And three, don't get me too hot in the month of July and August and give me plenty of more water. If you have plenty of water at that time, it's a pretty good bet you're gonna have an above average crop. Period. I just think that's how it works. If you go drier than normal for a four week period in the month of August, you're going to hurt the crop. If I look at weather right now and said, is there a problem? For the most part, no, but there's some issues that you got to watch. There is some heavy rains in Argentina and that slowed and may have prevented some of the corn and soybeans from being planted. I'd put that as minor. I don't think that's a major thing. Now, what is significant for you looking ahead is what's going to happen especially in the next two weeks in Brazil and it's going to be central Brazil, Mato Grosso and Paraná. Those will be the key areas to watch in the next two weeks. Why? They've changed the farming practice about from about five years ago. They used to be putting a lot of their corn in the ground and then they would just harvest it and that would be it. 
And then they started doing beans and put the beans in first and then plant corn after the beans are harvested. But what becomes tricky about this is there's a wet season and a dry season. So the trick is get the beans planted as early as possible, get them off in the month of late January into February. And if you can get the corn planted after the beans in February, you've got a chance of make, getting that corn to maturity and yield fairly decent before the dry season comes in. If you get pushed back too late to get the corn in and the dry season comes in earlier, you can devastate the crop. And that's what happened to them last year on the corn crop. But they've got so good at this that they've switched this over that 65% of all their corn they produce is all, all their eggs in one basket, so to speak, or 65%, betting that they can get the corn planted in this narrow window between February 1st and March 10th, and that the wet season will last long enough to give them a good crop. They've won four of the last five years. They've been very successful with this. And this is what makes it difficult right now. If you stay with excessively wet weather in these two states, Mato Grosso and Perona, then you could cause some issues down there. That's the next two weeks. You'd have to stay very wet, can't get the soybeans harvested on timely fashion, can't get the corn planted, and then you change it. Southern Plains in the U.S., dry, but that's about the only dry area it is. A lot of chatter about the heavy snowpack up in North Dakota. That could be watched closely, but that snowpack has been dwindling as of late. And it's just going to be out of where we are when spring rolls around. We do have a weak El Nino that's formed. South American soybean harvest is underway, slowed by wet weather. Brazil's first crop of soybeans of yield reports are coming off very good. We got a little bit of minor issues in Europe and in South, Southern Russia, but it's way too early for that. Corn planting in the U.S. get underway in March. In fact, I've been told now in the Delta, the Southern Delta states, the soil moisture is already warm enough to germinate corn in February. In February, it's warm enough, 50 degrees already to do that. Uh, in acreage estimates, wheat is gonna decline, corn should decline, soybeans will increase. Dryness, if you look at a drought monitor, it is drought, was a lot worse right here. That is diminishing. It is getting eased up. And I will also tell you, there's no crop growing in that area of any magnitude. We're the only dryness that would start to issue, and it is expanding, not decreasing, but it is expanding, is right here in your Oklahoma, Kansas, and now starting to move up into Missouri, almost encompasses all of Missouri, working its way now into southern Iowa and starting to nudge a little bit into western Illinois. That is where it is going. If it would go back about four weeks earlier, you would not have seen anything into Iowa at this time, but it's slowly but surely working itself into that northern part. So this would be something to watch. My first glance at this, I would say, all that would tell me is I'll be in the field on the first day that planting on my insurance date is ready to go corn planters will be dropped into the ground and ready to go, which sets the stage for an early harvest and a big crop, provided I stay away from drier than normal situation. I only put this down to just give you an uh, outlook of what could happen if you have uh, a wet spring. Because the last year, we didn't have a wet spring. Everything gets early, and prevent planting was about three and a half million acres. Wet springs, 2015, but the excessive wet years were 13 and 2011, when prevent planting jumped up to eight to nine million acres. Otherwise, if you go in with a drier than normal spring, then you won't have much impact on that. There's your South America. Those maps are in there. I won't spend too much time. That's the, the big uh, soybean producing area right now is right here. And this is the area that plants all of the Safinia corn crop. They do a little bit out in these edges, but the vast majority is right in this window. So that's where you got to focus, and that's the map. This is where you want it to be. If you're looking for higher grain prices in the short term, this is where you want it to be excessively wet for the next two weeks. And I do mean really wet. 
In Argentina, they did get heavy rains earlier in the year and they put a bullseye right in the heart of the top producing land in Argentina that uh, received some 15 to 16 inches of rain for the month. This last week, they put in some big rains right down here, four to five, and for the weekend, they're talking big rains right up into this area. Hog producers. We have any hog guys? We have a few, right? Okay. Pork production's on the rise. It's gonna go up about three to 4% forecasted for this year. Exports have been extremely strong in the last four months. Whether it can sustain that, I'm not sure. So, uh, in China, hog uh, production, they were in a, a big contraction. They now started to expand the hog herd again, but it's, they're also doing contraction. They're taking hog facilities along these major cities and major water areas, shutting them down and moving them out further to the north. Uh, Profit margin right now for a Chinese hog producer, if he wants to raise hogs, he's making about $110 a pig. That's his profit margin. That's not gross, he's pocketing that. So that money is gonna, you can definitely tell where the money will start to flow. Eventually, they will come after that. We do have a little bit of PERS and PED here in the US. Weekly chick placements, it's always your other competition. That's been strong for the last five months. Did have bird flu hit Europe, South Korea, Japan, India, and the Middle East this winter. And pork supplies, I think this is the, probably the biggest thing. Pork supplies in the coolers in the last three months has dropped at the fastest rate in the 27 years that I've ever kept track of the data. And it comes not at a time that we had less hog numbers coming. We had burdensome supply of hog numbers and we still took the inventory down. And that's what you call a demand driven market. There's your chick placements. I'll just go through this really quickly because it's in your book and you can always look at it, but there's nothing standing out. That's your big hog slaughter last year, or this past year over the previous year. And your imports now, starting to go here, but there's your pork exports. So your export business is pretty big. We do roughly about 26% of all the pork that we produce gets exported out, out of this country. Here's the one that I kept my eye on the most, and this is the price of pork in China, in US dollars, break it down, shift it back versus the US. That's pretty wide, suggesting the Chinese are gonna import pork into this country, into their country to make up for the shortfall. So that's what's happening, and that's where we're getting some of the extra business. Pork in the coolers, in that last three months, that is the biggest decline in a three month period that I've ever recorded on here, outperformed this one. Uh, so it is a big drop. A lot has been said about running out of bacon. Well, yeah, pork bellies in cold storage as of December 31st are the lowest ever on record as of December 31st. They've actually been lower here, but not at this time of the year. So that's the other one that gets going, which means then they have to take the price of bellies up until they do what? Ration demand. Basically what has to happen. So the hog market starts to move on up and we put in what I think is a big significant low. We broke above $53. And even in my wildest dreams, did I ever think we'd see hogs in two and a half months go from $53 to $74 in two months. But that's what we did with near record supply of hogs going to market. And now what you get to is you move the hog market up and this is what I'd start to look at. We held off on, uh, we've got about 30% uh, of the pigs sold in for April, March and April hogs. And this market has moved up and I basically go back onto a chart and since 2015, an April hog futures has never traded above 74 bucks. At that price level, and at this price level, I can make about 15 to $20 a pig profit. So I can tell you that from moving up from 54, and you know, I do my long range studies, and the average move when a hog futures contract comes on to the time it goes off, the distance it travels in price is about 18 to 20 bucks on average. So in other words, if my low is 54, 
What's my high going to be? 74. So it's a pretty good bet that I want to be a seller as we start entering this zone. And if I think something else could go wrong, which should take the market even higher, then turn back around and buy yourself a call. But we want to get more aggressive on our sales on our pigs right around in this $72 to $73 range and get them priced out. And if it doesn't, I'm already into that sell zone right now. I want to, that's what we're going to start looking at doing. So this is where you might come back and say, hey, instead of me buying a put, maybe I'll just sell the hogs all the way to the packer, forward contract them out, turn back around and buy myself a call. Or I might sit back and say, sell half of the pigs and be done. You could buy yourself a $73 call and cost you $250. Pigs are sold right here at $72. You walk away. The most you can lose is two and a half bucks and you've got profit guaranteed. On a June hog contract, as much as it's going, I simply think the upside target from 866 projects up to 66, 86 bucks. That's where I think it's likely to head to. And I can also just follow up on this steep uptrend line. And as long as it gets into this type, starts getting into this zone, I want to start looking to be a seller. And October hogs, I can look at the same thing, look across and find out where tops have been finding. And it would tell me somewhere between 72 to 75. You start getting closer to, before you get to those levels, start to find something to go into that zone. People always try to find a top tick on the market, love to do something better than the market. And they'd like to get $75. I always like to use the little routine of going, sell them at 73 and a half and just tell your buddies that you got 75. How are they going to know? Cattle market. Well, the slaughter started to slow down a little bit. Feedlot conditions have been nearly ideal outside of the upper Midwest, of course. Um, average slaughter weights have declined not only last week, but I just got the numbers in before I left here today and they declined uh, now 19 pounds below a year ago, which is very good because for every pound that the cattle come in less than a year ago or more is equal to us as if it was 1,000 more cattle, one way or the other. In other words, if you got the average cattle weight 19 pounds less than last year, it's equivalent as if you had 19,000 less cattle going to market. If they were to come in heavier, at five pounds above, it'd be like you had an extra 5,000 head of cattle going to market. So the object is, is to keep the weights down a little bit, keep your feed efficiency, and you should be able to get this thing going a little bit better in your favor. So right now, that's a good sign. Cattle herd is gonna continue to expand. So when I look at hogs expanding, cattle expanding, poultry expanding, it tells me what? I need more corn, and probably gonna consume more feed across the board as well too. There's your cattle weights, it's fine. Cow slaughter's doing just fine. Beef in the inventory with all this huge supply of beef, it's all time record high, but the beef market has actually started to work itself higher. Your imports of beef, because we were so high and short supply of cattle, we just imported more beef. Now that the price of beef has dropped back down, our imports, even though the dollar is going up, has actually started to decline. And our beef exports, because we now got lower, and even with a, a dollar going up, the beef exports are now hitting record levels. So we're exporting more beef. So why is that? What else has changed? Well, look at your competitors of who's in the world market and you've got Australian beef, and this is how much they would export on a yearly basis, and they spiked up dramatically in 14 and 15. Why? Beef prices were sky high. But at the same time, they got into a drought, so they just decided, let's keep liquidating our cattle because it's so good, and we'll worry about the problem further down the road. Well, now, they, in order they, to try to rebuild the herd back up, they have to keep the cattle off the, the market, so their export business is not only gonna be low this year, it's gonna be low in 2017. So they're gonna to have, to, somebody else has to fill this void. 
And you look at it and say, well, who's the top five countries that export beef in the world? And they are Brazil, now is number one. Australia was. Brazil is now back in. India is surprise. Australia, US, and then you tail off to New Zealand and a lot of these other smaller countries. And then you go back and say, well, who imports beef? And the US is the largest importer of beef. But here's a country that's coming on. And this is why I look at this Chinese situation and the wealth. And if their economy starts to do well and their wealth continues to build, then they become a factor and a market Im impact. Here's what's happening. In 2012, well, we're only talking four to five years from ago, Brazil, or excuse me, China, only imported roughly less than 100 million pounds of, or 100 um, uh, million pounds of beef. So extremely low. But look what's happened when they've now got the appetite and the wealth to start buying more beef. They're ratcheting up per every year, perpetually, continue to rise. Not just slowly, but rapidly. In 2012, they didn't even import as much beef as South Africa as a country. They are now number two in the world. At the pace they're going, they will be number three, or number one, in three years. In three years, they will outdo the United States. There's your top five importing countries, the United States. China will overtake the U.S. in three years. They'll import more beef than Japan and South Korea combined. So when we're talking about trade packs and getting along, this is another one that is an influence. Are they buying beef from the U.S.? No, we're still in, in uh, uh, halted because of mad cow back in 2004. But I hear that the paperwork is in place to start getting this signed off and eventually start taking beef from, uh, China will take beef from the U.S. So the cattle market has plunged sharply lower, acting now as should be a big low and starting to look like it wants to turn the market and head higher. Hillary is out of a job, and if you all remember, back in the eight, late 80s and early 90s, her first time that she ever traded commodities was cattle. And that was a very simple process. Buy it down here and you sell it at the high. It's really quite simple. You look at cattle, market has been going up, and again, you have to get corrections in the market. And corrections don't necessarily mean a bad thing. They can actually end up being a very good thing for it to have happen. So you had a market that came back down to 113 bucks. It at least appears to be holding at the time period. So I tell my guys in cattle, I think we're okay here. I think we're gonna be sideways to higher. But if we do go below 113 on February cattle, something's gone wrong and we're probably headed lower after this. But for right now, I think that's where it's going. In June cattle, when I look at where we are and I'm going, what could the price possibly go? My guess is if that's a bottom, then where do I think it's going to? I think it's gonna go back up into this gap area at about 113. So we've got about 30% of the cattle sold right now at about 107. And we're comfortable with that. It's a profit. My break even for most of these guys out here for cattle is about 91 to 94 bucks. That's what they need. At 106, I've got maybe about 120 to 140 dollars ahead profit. I want at least a third of it off. Even though I'm optimistic it's going higher in price, lay some of the risk off. Just because I stand up here and tell you this is what's going, I'm one guy, one person's opinion. If I'm wrong, you're wrong. Okay, so you've got to lay some of the risk off. I can't just say I'm spot on right. If you want to look at some type of option strategy, some of the people look at this. What would I see for the best thing? Well, you could buy yourself a $102 put. You could sell a call up here because if I think it's going to 114, what's, what's the heck's 112? It's pretty good money. And the bottom line is, and I could sell another put down here, and I put this all in and you do that for about 50 cents. In other words, you've got a floor here and you've got a cap here. And your cattle are gonna get sold someplace in this window. If it starts to go down, you're protected all the way until you get to this level. And your bet is, and my bet would be, is I don't think cattle are going below 95 bucks. I think your odds are pretty good. This might be an okay type of trade to put on place. 
So that or else you sell some percentage off. I elected to sell 30% of the cattle and sit with it for right now. Any dairy people? Okay. It's a little better times right now, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, after coming off a tough year, but I'm going to tell you, global milk production has likely bottomed out and we're likely to start turning it back up here a little bit more. Milk production in the U.S. is going to stay strong. And the only way I see that milk production declines between now and the end of this calendar year is if we go into a warmer than normal summer. So the only way I see it happening. So profit margins look very good. And this is what we've done with the milk. We were pretty fortunate last year. We had good coverage on. We started to sell milk and we started to sell the milk at about 1705 forward price on up to 1790. And we've got between 30 to 60% of the milk is sold all the way out to November. We like that price. We think it looks good. We know it's profitable. If I go back and look at a June milk chart, it did dip down below this level. It it's, came back though today and closed back above it. That's good. But here's what I would do. We, you could do this. We didn't yet, but this is another one. Get aggressive with your milk sales because that is very good profit by the time it's all said and done. If you can get 17 plus your premiums, you can walk away with all your feed inputs, you look pretty good. You could turn around and buy yourself an $18 milk call right here. You can pay about 40 cents and walk away and say, I'm done. I know I got profit. The most I can lose is 40 cents. Walk away. Your marketing's over with. That's it. You just go to cash your check each time it comes in and it shows you profitability. And then you've got July, August, and September, and you can see from there if whether or not you get into some type of weather scare. I'm not going to touch too much on energy. It really isn't that big of a deal right now. I'll touch a little bit with the charts, but here's another interesting one. How fast does China move? And this, just to give you an idea, in 2004, China was only selling about two to three million new cars a year. And at that time, I remember people making comments that by 2015, China would overtake the United States in new car sales at the pace they were going. They did it by 2008. In four years, they got serious about doing this. And I'm just going to tell you, I think they're going to get serious about a lot of things if they want to start changing. But that's what's happened. And they never relinquished the new car, uh, new car sales. That's Chai's car sold in China. China's buying cars against the United States. This is how many new cars the U.S. sells every year in million cars. And that's how many cars China's doing. Crude oil production still staying there and they're going to try to cut it. Demand has dropped back off some. Chart-wise, if you look at all the crude production and everything else, crude should keep going down. But the bottom line is some, you've got to make money somewhere down the road, right? If you don't, you're done. Eventually, the energy sector has got down to a low level and people are going, we're going to drive oil prices all the way down to $25 to $30 a barrel. i got news for you. Most of them can't survive. So eventually, there comes a price point. It may go down there, but it can't stay there for a long period of time. It just doesn't work. So this market's now come back up. So as much as you want to keep going and oil prices are going lower and all this, it's now started to go back up above levels that we haven't seen since 2015. And it looks to me like this market also wants to go up. And I would not be surprised that oil in another year to a year and a half is trading at $66 a barrel or higher. Your heating oil, diesel fuel that you have, very warm, mild winter. But despite that, it still slowly but surely climbs higher. I wouldn't be surprised that in within a year and a half to two years that we don't have diesel fuel back trading about 240 a gallon. You're there in ethanol. You've had a very profitable year. It's held you together very nicely. That looks good. And your profit margins have come back down to uh, break even. But I will tell you that this week it jumped back up to about seven to eight cents. Big, nice week this week in the ethanol sector. 
and your corn ground for ethanol is going on at a rapid pace. But keep this in mind. The Chinese just announced that they're going to put in more ethanol plants. They just told the U.S. and they were the second largest importer of U.S. ethanol, buying U.S. ethanol. They took their import tariff, which was 5%, and raised it to 30%. In other words, you want to bring in U.S. ethanol, it'll, you have to bring, you, as a Chinese, you have to pay a 30% tax to bring it in. So odds are that ethanol going in from U.S. ethanol going into China is not going to happen, which probably leads me to believe that Chinese are going to do what? Raise, do their own ethanol. They're not going to bring in DDGs anymore. They put a big import, 70% import tariff on DDGs because they've got such a burdensome supply of corn, they want to get rid of that corn. So they're going to do more, whatever they can to get corn-based products and use up that surplus corn. Where's that, where, what's going to feed those ethanol plants? Where's that coming from? They, they, they have roughly, Jim, uh, an estimated between 110, which is uh, roughly 3.5, and some people think maybe as much as six billion bushels of corn sitting in storage. That was raised in China? Yes. The Chinese, from roughly around 2007 and 8, when corn prices started going, China was going, this is ridiculous. Corn prices are going up. So they subsidized farmers roughly about nine bucks a bushel. Pay and put $30 billion, to, and so the farmers just planted as much corn as they possibly can wherever they could go. Then what happens, the price of corn in the world market, it was fine because the world prices were ranged between seven bucks to eight bucks during a three year period. So no big deal. Now all of a sudden the price, the world price of corn is going boom, down to roughly four bucks. China's holding the bag out here going, we subsidize all this corn for nine bucks, we own, and it's all piled up. We could actually go out and take our $30 billion and buy U.S. corn for four bucks a bushel. Stop subsidizing corn at nine bucks, which they did. Now the price of corn in China has dropped all the way down to about $5.90 a bushel. So the livestock guy who was being devastated because it's too high liquidated hogs. Now hog price has gone up. And these are the policy changes that you gotta be aware of of what's happening. So now the Chinese are saying, we gotta get rid of this corn. If we sell it in the export market, we take a haircut from nine bucks down to four and a half. What can we do to utilize and get rid of this corn? Change it to, from ethanol or to uh, corn-based plastics. Use more ethanol, which they said never use food for, for fuel. Waste of time but they've got pollution coming out of their ears, try to get cleaner fuel, and they all need this because they got poor quality crude, as I understand, and they need to raise octane up to get the cleaner air, is what they're after. So all this is changing and gonna change fast, yes. It, it, uh, there are reports that as much as 25 to maybe 40 percent is already going out of condition. So they're well aware of that. I used to work, got out of high school, I got a job, supposed to be part-time and turned into full-time in about two weeks. And I, it turned out I, they put me as a state spot checker and I had to go around and check all this corn. And that was back in the early 80s when we used to, farming was, you stored corn, you raised corn, you had subsidy, you raised corn, you got paid 34 cents a bushel for the year, and we're going, this is pretty good, just go to, you, your only income was go to the mailbox and get your check from the government. That was it, because we did the same thing. We had corn subsidized at 275 to 290 a bushel. The world price was down here, nobody would buy our corn. Reagan came in and goes, well, this is ridiculous. And he just, remember he pulled out the plug and said, we're going to pick certificates and get rid of the dang corn. The decision was made and it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened because it was unsustainable to keep doing what we were doing. And you go out and you'd measure these bins and check it. If it, we would just rotate the corn out. You'd get rid of the old stuff and then you replace it with the new. 
but some guys would go two years or three years. I'll guarantee you, you had corn that was in the bin for three years, you had bugs crawling around in there, you had every, it was difficult to keep corn, even in great facilities that we had. And I would be willing to bet we got better facilities back in the 1980s than China does today. So my guess is, if somebody tells me that's 25 to 45 percent of the corn is spoiled, I think I'd take their word on that one. What about apple cotton? Oh, that's this year's crop. Yes, um, it's bad in in locations. Uh, northeast Iowa. It starts going, and then as you keep going east, Indiana is pretty bad, so is Ohio, but Indiana might be the epicenter of the aflatoxin, which then is going into the DDGs and things like this. They'll work it through, they'll blend it off as they get going, but it does have some impact on your animal feed. You gotta put binders in, things like this, for the animals to eat it. Yeah, oh yeah. I thought her presentation that she was talking about of what we put into our bodies is, was interesting comments. Fuel prices, where they were, I'll just leave that so you can have it in the book and you can look at that as you go through. So livestock markets, that's where they're at. They still look good after coming off devastating losses. I think things get better for them as they go into next year. Now to your grain complex. Well, we've got an abundant supply of, of wheat globally, but it's a tighter supply of what's called good quality milling wheat in the world. Everybody, when wheat prices get so high, plant it wherever you can throughout the world. But we just threw the uh, wheat in and it, away it went, but eventually we ended up with three years of big wheat harvest, and now we've got a surplus of wheat, but a lot of it got wet, rained on as it came close to harvest, and we ended up with a lot more poor quality wheat globally. The U.S. winter wheat crop, you see how we're changing uh, what we want to do? We're going to have the least amount of winter wheat in this country dating back to 1909. Think about that. 1909, we've got less wheat acres than since 1909. Spring wheat could slip a little bit more if this wet weather pattern, at the, they've got a lot of snowpack up there, although it has diminished uh, some, but again, if they got into something wet, that would be a decline there. Uh, I think the wheat harvested this year will drop another three to four percent. The reason I say that is, is the wheat rating, and it doesn't really mean that much yet, but just to give you an idea, wheat as in Oklahoma on January 1st, rated 25% good to excellent. Last year it was rated 77% good to excellent. So it's going here. I've got some customers in Kansas and my comment, and they did pick up some rain and I asked them, I said, what do you plan to do with the, are you gonna harvest the wheat? And he goes, we're actually thinking that either wheat prices come on up or we might be better off to just graze it for cattle, take it as forage because it's not worth harvesting because there's such a glut of wheat. So if the wheat market goes lower, we're not harvesting this year's wheat crop. We're gonna cut it as hay. And that's it, yes? I'm from North Dakota, and my local elevator sells seed. The corn acres look like it's gonna be up a little bit. Soybean acres are looking at probably, they're guessing right now, probably 10 to 15% 10 to more <coughs> soybean acres. Just my area. Just in your area. Which, which part of North Dakota? Where, whereabouts? Carrington. Carrington, which is? Central. Central, okay. Yeah, and I think from everything I hear, there's just a lot of grain that's just piled up yet? Piled all over. All over. Um, Jamestown, PB and Jamestown are gathering now, whatever you want to call it. Supposedly had a pile of soybeans that were 900,000 bushel. And there, it looks like there's going to be a hundred thousand bushels out of that pile. That's total crap. And there is a elevator. That's that, that's a no value. It's wasted. You mean? Rotten yeah, pile. rotten on the pile. Yeah. And they they, they save some of it, but there's hundred thousand. They don't think they need to blend. And there's supposedly an elevator in southern North Dakota right now that's hauling up into the Valley City area to their sister elevator. And the stuff they're hauling up is 50 to 90% damage from the pile. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, 
the, the, what I hear is, and you have you, you only have one direction to go with the with the product. You don't have enough ethanol plants to support the corn. You have to go to the west coast. What what you got hurt with, and there's a lot of beans going to China. Don't get me wrong, but you got slowed down here as of late because of the heavy snowpack through the mountain areas on the west coast to going out on the rail. And that caused a little bit of, but bottom line is, you guys ended up in North Dakota with a record large corn and soybean yield, not, a, not by a little, by a landslide. And that just causes you the, the headaches. So they're, they're saying to you that corn acreage actually will go up in North Dakota, or seed sales are up, and bean sales are up significantly. Yep, and the wheat sales. A lot of people are not raising wheat at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's going to replace those? You say wheat now. What's replacing those acres? Soybeans. Soybeans, even in Oklahoma. Yeah, Oklahoma, Kansas. Here's my Kansas guys are telling me that they're also uh, farmers are going to more beans and less corn, and I said, oh, on the dry land. He goes, no, on the irrigated ground irrigated because they're drier than normal right now that if they don't get moisture it costs too much to run the irrigation pivots they'll do corn they can cheapen it by going to soybeans so it's a cost of the water more than anything else so they're gonna they're gonna make a shift so there's guys going we hear more of it about financially being told this is all the money you're getting and this is what you're gonna put in people trying to cut some cost I hear this numerous times. I just either, I, it just a lot of times it just doesn't come to be as much chatter as you hear as it goes in. But I do think you're, you're absolutely right. It's still look for the bean acres to go on up. Whether it jumps dramatically, I don't know, or they find another alternative to the crop. Well, last year was a huge year up there. And I mean, most people had 20, 25 bushel better corn. Yes. On record. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. So they've got a good taste. That's what's in their mind. Now they just want their basis is incredibly wide, no place to go with it, and somebody suffers. Fifty-five cents, I think, right now. Well, yeah, fifty years. You know, you're probably wider than fifty. If you're fifty-five cents on basis, I'll bet you're wider than that. I'm hearing. Yeah, I'm hearing 75 and 80 to 90 cents, yes. Huh? You're five over. Yeah. In fact, I hear going out to Ohio, there are train loads leaving Iowa and Nebraska headed to Ohio for corn. Yes, that is correct. Yep. That is what I'm hearing, or it's actually going on rail. So even in central Iowa, the basis has actually started to come. It's, it's, it's coming in. It's just that it's, it's, you're gonna be on the last, you're the last guy at the end of the line <laughs> in North Dakota, okay? They announced the big soybean plant going into Jamestown yesterday. Did they? When does it start? I heard rum rumblings about this. They said when it's up and going, it should take a third of the soybeans produced in North Dakota to keep it running. Okay. I, let's hope it starts next month, <laughs> but I think it'll take a little longer, but it, those are just things that are going to change down the road, and that's exactly how you start looking at marketing plans, the looking ahead. It's not going to come to you this year, but it's going to eventually in another year and a half, two years, that's the way it goes. Uh, okay, so that's where we sit there. Global wheat production or uh, carryouts, supplies, all-time records, your wheat yields, in the U.S. jumped, not only did they go up, they just blew everything away last year. So either everybody, it all fell into place, or if we're into a whole new era of yields, this is phenomenal. But my guess is we come back down on this one. When the carryout's all said and done, and USDA did do a report today, this dropped to 1.136 billion bushels. So it actually went down, not up. Everybody looked for it to get higher. It went down. And that sent out a little bit more of a friendly news to the wheat market here today. 
And when you look at wheat and you've got all this burdensome supply of wheat, the crop's big and there's no weather problems, you look around and you say, well, the, if I look at everything fundamentally, I would think all these markets should go which way? Down. It's too much of everything. But when you look at the chart, the chart, and this is where you start learning, we had never been able to go above 427 on wheat on a continuation chart, on a weekly chart, dating all the way back into 2005, uh, 2016. Then you broke above it, and as soon as you do that, and it starts to move up like this, then any setback, you should find pretty good support when it gets back to this red line. So it goes like this. And now you can start seeing how it goes up, holds a higher, what I call a higher right side, and this one goes up, takes out this high, this dip comes down to this level, and then hopefully you start moving higher. My guess is, where do I think this is going when I look at this pattern? I believe wheat's headed to four, Kansas City wheat, to 490 to five bucks a bushel this year. I think Chicago wheat today was up, I believe almost 10 cents a bushel, and Chicago wheat took out this level right here, which is about four, was 440. It took it out, closed at about 444, so it closed right about here. Now what's interesting about this is that the outside speculative money, you've got the farmer and that raises and hedges the stuff, and then you've got outside people that are out here saying, I just wanna bet which way this market's going. Well, they're betting in wheat by at the tune of about 110,000 contracts, betting it's going down. They're short, the wheat market. Outside spec money, banks, whatever else, whoever else is doing it, they're betting the wheat market's going down. How do you think they feel today? Yeah, you wanna know what they're gonna start looking at? If they're, on their, they're getting either a margin call, and they're either saying, come up with the money, or do what? No, they're already short. You gotta buy it back. You gotta buy back what you sold, which then means it goes up faster, right? Because how many of you farmers are gonna look at saying, I wanna sell wheat here because it's $4.30? Heck, most of them are thinking they don't even wanna plant it or harvest it because it's too low. They'll only do it if prices go which way? Up. It's not high enough, so there's no selling. So you get what's called a pocket of air, and the market just goes up much easier because there's too many people already betting it's going down, and their bet is wrong. And if the wheat market starts to move higher, what's it good for? Well, corn would be my next thought, that the corn market should then be a little bit more supported because higher wheat prices. So eventually, wheat's gonna to try to go up to a level that attracts the people in North Dakota to say, eh, maybe, maybe I do wanna put some wheat in, not sure. I think weather plays a big part when it comes in. Now, you go to corn. Corn market, Chinese corn prices, no longer nine bucks a bushel. Last year, it was 782 as it started to come down. Now it's at, uh, change that, it's up to 590, about 567 to 590. In Chinese soybean price, 17 bucks a bushel in US dollars versus 1530 a year ago. So look at this difference last year and what it is now this year. China takes their import duty on DDGs, raises it up to 70%. We need to use more of our corn, so quit bringing in US DDGs to compete against the corn or the meal, whatever else. We're gonna try to get rid of this pile of corn. But if they're gonna eliminate DDGs, what do they have to do? It's a protein source, right? So now I need more soybeans. So everybody's going, that's bearish. I'm going on an interview, going, I don't think so guys. Might be a little more friendly because now I need more beans than I did before. So when we sit back and go, why is the bean market not going down? It's because the demand has got stronger. No different than all this hog market with this huge supply of pork, but all of a sudden it wasn't enough. The demand was greater than the supply was. So if you could start getting combinations of prices start to shift, now all of a sudden, what does the China, what's it look like now? I'd rather probably put beans in in China than I would to corn. 
because of the price ratio. If China starts to shift over a little bit of 12 million acres of cropland, if that truly becomes reality, that would be encouraging. U.S. farmer shifts back a little bit more or less corn in this one, and the wheat starts to come back on up, then maybe we start to see some better prices. If I look at globally, record supply of corn, no doubt about it. When I look at all these numbers, this carryout went down about 50 million, so 22.320, I believe, is the number that came out. We're real close to it, but it dropped down about 50 million bushel. And everything else, the animal units stay, so I think the feed usage stays up pretty strong. We had a big yield. So what would need to change to get prices to go higher? Well, I just do some quick math to look ahead and say, well, if I plant 90, we planted 94 million acres last year. If I plant 91, 89, or 87, what would have to happen to get things more bullish? If I plant 91 million acres and I have a yield of 171, another good yield again, I'm going to probably, and no problem in South America, I'm probably going to have a carryout of 2.7 billion bushels of corn. Not good. We're going lower than where we are right now. At 89, and I think I'm going to be someplace in here. I don't think I'm going down to 87, but I think we're going to be one of these two patterns. But the bottom line is this. If I get 167, I'm going down to about 2 billion bushel. And this is where things start getting interesting. In a nutshell, if there's no problem in South America on their corn crop, and they end up with a pretty good corn crop, the U.S. farmer would have to plant, in my view, 90 million acres or less and the national corn yield would have to be under 167 bushel per acre to see corn prices going anywhere as higher than this. If you want to get something that's wildly bullish, you're going to have to talk about something that's a significant weather problem, and that means only 87 million something gets wet, 87 million acres gets planted, yield goes to 162, 1.3, something like this were to happen, you'd probably see corn make a move to five bucks. I'd say the odds right now is nix this one because that's not in the cards at the present time. That might be something you could look at in June or maybe in May if it's excessively wet. Otherwise, look for something in this window right here. Probably suggesting that corn maybe goes to 410, 420, 440 is about what you could expect on the futures. Chinese, I took their number. On the corn last year, if they put corn in versus beans, they made a profit of 260, it paid $267 more to put corn in than it did to beans. This year, 21 bucks. That's the difference. This is where I think you might see a little shift of more beans in China, a little less corn. Not significant, but I do think that'll happen. Our export business in corn has still been outstanding. The blue is this year. That's the cumulative sales of corn versus last year at this time. Corn market, which way is the trend? It looks to me like it's going up. All the negative news and we're marching just a little bit higher. As long as you keep, just take this blue line, as long as you keep staying above this blue line, you're fine. My guess is, is that you can close higher again tomorrow. My guess is you're going to move up towards 390 to 4 bucks. You go back and look at these charts and you start finding, well, where did it stop? In other, look off to the far sides. And then you start finding stopping points here, here, and here. Just draw it across and just bet that that's about where the market will head to. Give you some ideas and some price points. And the other thing that I would tell you to do in marketing is you're always, I think, better off to put your sale price target in, call whoever you're selling it to, and put the order in. And don't look back at it, okay? Because I did exactly what you should not do on last year when I had chart counts and I came in and I'd gone in advance, mind you, about 10 days in advance, send out a video going, if I'm right, the corn market is going to peak on June 13th. That is the high day. We're going to sell corn. I walked in in the, in the office and the first phone call that phone that rang was the weather guy going, I think we got to change the weather pattern. I don't see any moisture for the next two to 
two weeks minimum. And I go on, whoa, I got South America already in problem. And I waved off the sail. It rained Sunday night. <laughs> and the market opened 16 lower, and the next day was limit down. And never looked back. So I sit back and I'm going, well laid plans, did my chart work, and I, as I told you guys, there's nothing better when you've got the, when you follow the plan and it's fit into a T, and there's nothing worse than when you're off. So I went from riches to rags in a matter of three days, and I had it pegged to a T, and missed it, and did not execute. If you want to make money, execution is still part of it. There's always got to be a decision. No decision is a decision, but you're better off to make a yes or no. Weekly corn chart on July corn, right now, looks like you come into an area on the down. See on these solid stops down in here? So I take, once it gets above this level, I go back and I look where's the next spot. Looks about 396. And I can assure you that if you call up your elevator and ask where farmers are looking at making sales, I'll bet you that at 396 is probably going to get them back pretty close to 350 to 360 cash corn. And people in Minnesota want 350 to 360 cash corn is going to get sold. Period. July, whoops, go back here. December corn did poke above here, went to 398. My guess is this. It looks like it's doing this. Correction starts the next leg up. So if you take this distance and you add it on to this one, it would get you a target back up here at about 410 to 415, which lines up beautifully. And that would be your next in target. Our first target to sell is 409. We're going to use the 409 and tell everybody we got the 414, if it gets the 414. Four cents, markets move four cents, three cents every day. You know, just pick a point and move. In summary, the exports are still strong on the corn. It stays that way. Funds are net short this corn market. I think rallies up at this 385 to 395 in July is going to be viewed as some selling opportunities. Watch your Safinia corn. It gets planted earlier than normal. And watch the month of April and May in South America. That is when the corn, when you're in the field, the Safinia corn crop will be pollinating when you start planting corn. That is pollination in South America. Okay, That's, that is going to be critical time frame there as well too. Soybeans, China's demand for beans, I think, is going up by 6 million metric tons versus what they did last year. Therefore, South America better have this 104 million metric ton crop in Brazil, and it better have 56 in, in Argentina. Anything that comes less than that is going to result in less beans, and all of a sudden, the demand is going to be greater than what the supply is. Uh, Chinese soybean, uh, corn soybean hit a record high in here. Uh, I think you could see some more beans, a little less corn. Crush margins in China are up to some of their best levels in two years. I think the Brazilian soybean crop, for the most part, is made. Wet weather is the only thing, excessively wet weather is the only thing that can hurt the crop now. And I am hearing a little bit of quality issues popping up there. Um, if there is no wet problem in South America, what's it's looking like it's not. And at this time, if U.S. goes up five, six million more acres and does not have a crop problem, don't rule out beans could go down to 880 a bushel. Short term, it looks like this on the exports, which is fine, above a year ago. But all our business is going to slow down dramatically as it goes to South America for the time being. And nothing changed on the S&D on the beans. It stayed the same, 420, and the trade was looking for it to go to 400. I still think this market could be extremely volatile. How do I think it could change? Well, my guess is this. If we get plant 85, we planted 84 last year, we go to 85 million acres, and a 46 and a half bushel would have, in other words, you're gonna have to have a bad August. You maybe go down to 322. I think you're gonna be someplace in one of these two zones, which means you could be between 500 to 700 million bushels 
on the carry out on beans and that would be bad news if he ended up with good weather. The only way I see that changing would be something goes wrong in South America, brings it down. That doesn't look like it's happening. So my guess is we sit someplace in this window and I'd probably target this one. Always, when I do these, usually whichever one's in the middle is kind of the one I, I'm kind of zooming in on when I try to look ahead. Then I just take that, I'm going, it should go lower. And I look at the charts and I'm going, but it's not. Why are we not going down? And that is because your demand is still holding relatively good. Speculative trader is really long the soybean market. Um, they're up at levels right now that if you want to play this game, I'd say you look just like this. We're 90% sold on old crop beans. And I would say this, if this market, just follow this trend, take your July chart and you just draw a line. Start with here, line it up with this one here and you'll notice, look how it's just, it's following this to a T. So I think this is a pretty good pattern. Either up at 1099 or just keep following this blue line. But if it ever takes it out, just sell them. Walk away, be done with it on the beans. But you could follow that all the way through and be just fine with that market. And you'll do very well with your sales. The November 17 beans, it looks like this. You've been flirting up and there's a key number that I would have you jot down. It's $10.44. If the November soybeans close above 1044, just purely looking at, they shouldn't do this with all the crop now being made for the most part in South America. But if they take out 1044, something's probably going wrong or we've got something else that's going on. If that happens, I would not be surprised to see November beans make a push to 1080 to 1125 a bushel. That's where I think they could go if they take this out. Because me personally, I sit here and I'm going, we're at $10.25 for November beans. Why are we not already down to $9.50 or lower? That's what I ask myself every day I come into work. I don't get it. The speculative guy's really long the soybeans. He's betting it's going up. And so far, it's not that he's winning but it is at least doing better than the guy who's short and it continues to work on up. But that would be some key numbers and you can do the same here and just draw a trend line. We're at 30% so we think we want to have something done here in this $10 a bushel. Some people, let's see if I have this in, yeah. Some people are also doing this. This is a soybean chart it goes all the way back, way back. But this is looking at beans. Some people are also doing this. We just made a straight out 30% sale, a little over 10 bucks a bushel and say, okay, just sit there. We'll see if the basis doesn't narrow later on. Others are doing this. They're buying a 1020 put. They're gonna sell an 1140 call. Not gonna buy it. They're gonna, they're gonna try to cheapen this up because this is gonna cost you about 60 cents to do. Then they're, they're selling an 1140 call and then they're gonna sell a $9 put. And that's gonna cost them about 15 to 20 cents to get this done. That's their cost. Now they're still subject to margin call if the market goes higher. But basically what this strategy does is says, okay, if you put this on, the worst you're gonna get for your beans is 10 bucks. You're guaranteed at least the floor at 10 bucks. It'd have to go all the way up to 11.39. In other words, you're gonna sell your beans someplace in this window right here. If it goes lower, you're capped until it, unless it dropped below nine bucks a bushel, you, you're gonna be good for about 10 bucks all the way on out. And some are doing it, a portion of their beans, 20% or 30% this way as well, especially if they're in a position that they are gonna plant a lot more beans than they did before. But it's just the way you put some type of position on to hold things in check. And I don't have a problem with that strategy at all either. Soybean meal, and the only reason I bring this up is because the meal has started to move a little bit higher. It's broke out of a pattern. It came right back down, which is 328 and it came right back to 328 and held and started to go back on up. I'm gonna sort of tell you that if soybean meal, which has really been the lagger, 
is the reason why soybeans aren't a lot higher. If all of a sudden something comes in that soybeans start to, meal starts to move up, then the soybeans are going to go higher than you may think. In other words, what I look at, and this has always got me on the back of my mind, is that I think it should go on up. But this soybean meal is rather interesting because it is broke up, it came back out to the up, broke out to the upside, came back down to this level, and now starts turning. If this is a correction and it starts to move higher, and I don't know that, but if it gets above this level and starts going, I will assure you that November bean, or beans will go to 11 bucks or better on the board. If you take out that high that you're seeing right here on the meal at that level, if it takes that out, I'll assure you that beans are going over 11 bucks a bushel. Okay. If you ever are interested, in, and we, you do have a little card that I'd ask you to fill out, because I will do one door prize here uh, for a little pork package that I'll send out to you. But if you are interested in any of our services, this is what we have. We do a newsletter, $485 a year. If you want to get a, our newsletter, and it just runs the grain, does not do the livestock, that's separate. If you want to do a, a 800 tape or a newsletter combination, and we do twice a day updates, that's $900 a year. And Premier working one-on-one -on -one with us, then that is, you talk to us individually and we, we work that through. Or if you want any brokerage service or anything like that, we also set that up individually as well. You can just check one of the boxes if you want to, or Brett Sweeney, who's in the back that works with me, he will contact you and we can go from there. 